So I can see you grinning already at the back. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the, the last of our keynote speeches today at Science World, uh, and thank you for joining us. Uh, Hannah Critchlow, uh, Dr. Hannah Critchlow, in fact, is, uh, is our speaker this afternoon. Um, and Hannah is the Science Outreach Fellow at Magdalen College, uh, Cambridge University, um, has been named a top 100 scientist by the Science Council for her work in science communication. She's listed as one of the University of Cambridge's most inspirational and successful women in science and appears regularly on TV shows uh, and radio and festivals discussing and exploring the brain. Uh, and recently, she's just told me, she was uh, listed as one of Cambridge University's rising stars of biological science. In the past year, Hannah's co-presented uh, BBC Tomorrow's World Live, The Secret Lives of Four and Five-Year-Olds, uh, and a BBC Two TV series, Family Brain Game, with Dara O'Brien. Uh, Hannah has also helped judge the Wellcome Trust Book Prize and has published two books of her own. Uh, one entitled Consciousness, uh, a Ladybird Expert Guide, uh, and the other, The Science of Fate. Uh, and that book was actually accompanied by a, a Radio 4 documentary exploring the science um, behind destiny. So, before I introduce the actual talk, I need to let you know that there is some audience participation today. Um, yeah, I don't think we'll be picking on you, but any volunteers. I've uh, already gone through this, and it doesn't hurt too much. Um, <laughs> so, taking us through how the technological revolution is unraveling the mysteries of the mind for what promises to be a fascinating keynote speech, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Hannah Krishnan. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. And I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, before we start discussing some of the technological revolutions that are helping us to understand what's going on in our minds, I want to take you back in history and take you on a little journey. So, oh, to do that, sorry, what I'd like you to do is start by staring at the center of this spiral. So keep your gaze at the center of the spiral. You can blink, but do not, under any circumstances, look away. And whilst you do that, I'd also like you to start to imagine this. All the way back in 1834, a Scottish rambler called Mr. Robert Adams decided to take himself out for an afternoon stroll. He was in the Highlands, and he was admiring all the heather strewn across. He descended down into a little valley, and whilst there, he stumbled across this absolutely beautiful waterfall. He was mesmerized by this downward cascade of water, in much the same way as you are getting mesmerized and enchanted and hypnotized by this rotating spiral. After a few minutes, Mr. Robert Adams was able to finally divert his gaze. He was able to look away. And when he did, his entire world had changed. In much the same way as when you now all now look at my face, or look at my face, you should see something rather peculiar. Hopefully that worked. Oh, a whirling, yes, it's the whirling thing. Did that work for anybody? Maybe not, for you. Yes, have I got, what have I got? A big head. <laughs> I do have a big head, especially after Tim uh, introducing me like that. That was very nice. Um, so that type of visual illusion was first documented over 120 years ago. Um, and it's only really recently that scientists have been able to probe deeply into the brain and into the mind to try to uncover exactly how that change in reality, that change in perception, which is just temporary, so hopefully my head has now gone back to its normal size and isn't moving around the place quite so much, but how that type of illusion occurs. And so bear with me now, I've got kind of one slide of facts and brain theory, but we've got to get this out of the way in order to move on with the rest of the talk. So your brain weighs about 1.5 kilograms, which isn't a huge amount, it's about the same as a big bag of sugar or a cauliflower, and it looks a little bit like a cauliflower too. But inside your brain, 
There's about 86 billion nerve cells, which is a colossal number of nerve cells. It's about 14 times the number of people on this planet in terms of nerve cells in your head, which again is just almost too big a number to comprehend. So if you imagine that I went up to you and uh, managed to drill into your skull and snatch out a very small amount of your brain tissue, about maybe the size of a sugar grain, and looked at that under the microscope, what I'd see is about 10,000 nerve cells. 10,000 nerve cells in that very small amount of your brain tissue. And then expand it out to the entire 1.5 kilograms of your brain tissue and the high volume that you have, and you've got 86 billion nerve cells. So I'm talking about these nerve cells, but what exactly are they, these units of the brain? Well, they look a little bit like this. Uh, so they've got, each one has got a cell body inside which there's the DNA um, in the nucleus, and this is basically the director of the cell, instructing the cell how to act. And then extending out from that cell body is an axon, a long cylindrical structure, which is a little bit, I, I kind of imagine it, like a tree trunk for a tree, and studded across the membrane of that axon, uh, little holes, little pores. And basically what happens is the um, axon here pumps sodium and potassium ions in and out of that long tree tr trunk-like structure. And that, that, that movement of ions actually causes a zip. It happens really quickly. It causes a zip of electrical current to zip along that axon structure at speeds of about 120 or 130 miles an hour, zipping along your axon. Now, at the end of that axon, at one end of it, it is um, huge amounts of arborizations, almost like the arborizations of a tree, branches of a tree extending out. And it happens on both sides here. And, and these arbors, these tree branches, are studded with little connectors um, which allow one nerve cell, each one of your 86 billion nerve cells, to connect up to up to 10,000 other nerve cells, which basically gives rise to your brain containing about 100 trillion connections. And these connections allow that electric current to zip across from one nerve cell and move to the next nerve cell and move around your brain so that your brain can transfer all this electrical energy, this electrical uh, kind of current zipping around your brain. And it, this... This electric current movement is basically how we can process information from the world around us, try and make sense of it, to give us our sense of reality, our perception of the world, and then it allows us to send electric signals, again via the nervous system, the nerves in the body, so that we can change the world around us through movement or through communication, through speech. And there we go. So we've basically uncovered the point to our existence, is to process incoming information from the world around us, try and make sense of it using the power of electricity, and then change the world around us by directly moving things, for example, or by communicating with each other. OK, so there we go. Point of existence solved. Um, so there we go. There's, there's the really quick introduction to uh, neuroscience in one slide. Um, I've whistled through that. I think it's kind of time now, really, to put that theory to the test with an experiment. And that's the experiment that looks at whether we really do use the power of electricity in order for our nervous system to work. So can anyone think of a pretty mean experiment that we could do to try and test that hypothesis? Yep. Attach electrical probes to somebody and then see what happens. Exactly, that's what we're going to do. Do you want to be a volunteer? I think so, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for volunteering for this. So what I have here is an electrical probe, which actually, um, this uh, is actually an electric shock panel. <laughs> so so um, it's kind of so we're doing a similar kind of experiment. We're going to apply this electric shock panel to what's your name? I'm Sam. Sam, hi Sam. Nice to meet you. Um, to Sam, to part of Sam. Uh, which part of Sam do you think we should apply this electric shock panel to? <laughs> do I get to veto choices? I'm not sure, Sam. <laughs> arm? Arm. You're, like, you're okay with arm? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. Okay, we'll do it to the arm. Well, there's one nerve in the body, which is, so I'm not allowed to um, kind of 
uh, bury this deep into Sam's brain. I'd need to do a different risk assessment for that, uh, which I haven't done. Um, however, scientists have been doing exactly that. They have been um, doing some wonderful preclinical studies where they make a miniature version of an electric shock panel and actually, uh, in kind of using brain surgery, um, kind of embed it very deeply into a very discrete region of the circuit within the brain. And in doing so, they can switch on or off symptoms of really severe symptoms of addiction or depression or obsessive compulsive disorder. So just using the power of electricity embedded in very discrete circuits within the brain, which we're not going to be doing to Sam today. Um, but instead, we're going to be applying this electric shock to his ulnar nerve, which is one of the most exposed nerves in the body. Um, it, the ulnar nerve runs all the way down from your shoulder all the way to your wrist. Um, and it helps to control movement in your hand, um, particularly your little finger. Uh, so, you know when you hit your funny bone? Oh, no. It's not very funny, is it? No. It's not very funny. Uh, that's because right there on your funny bone is the most exposed part of the ulnar nerve. So, usually your ulnar nerve is under the control of your motor cortex, which runs here like an Alice band. If you imagine an Alice band nicely on Sam's head. So this part of the motor cortex right here initiates an electric signal, which then sends that electric current all the way across his connectome, down here to the nerves that are connecting up to the ulnar nerve. And then that electric signal is being sent down the ulnar nerve past the, ulnar ner past the um, funny bone, the olecranon, which is where uh, it's really exposed, and then sends the, sends the signal to his hand. So what we're going to do, be doing, instead of Sam using his brain to control movement in his hands, instructing him to move or not, we are going to be circumnavigating that and acting downstream by inducing an electric current. Okay, so... There's different settings for this which we can have a play with. Um, <laughs> how are you feeling, Sam? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah? Okay, all right, so I'm going to switch it on now. It might take a while to, uh, to play around with uh, getting the settings right. Okay, can you feel anything? Yeah, I can feel that. Okay, so... Oh. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Can you control your movement? Yeah, just. Just. Can you stop the... Yeah. You can. You can use, use the power of your own electricity to send signals here to contract. So if you now allow it to move, right. if it's go, has it gone back? That's it. That's it. Just place it on directly. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's it. Okay, so if you keep it there... Yeah. Let's try and keep it. That's it. You've got to really press it. That's it. Uh, You've got to press it. Yeah. That's it. Can everybody see? And then, do you mind if I try and just play with some of the settings? Okay, <laughs> um, so what I'll do is increase the current. Right. That's <laughs> uh, and then I might switch it off. Oh. Ah, that's nice. And on. Oh. <laughs> and off. And on. There we go. Thank you. So that's demonstrating the power of electricity. Thank you so much, Sampion. Thank you. Um, so that was demonstrating the power of electricity in the nerve cells which are in our body, but we've also got 86 billion of those nerve cells uh, in our brain that use exactly the same power of electricity, movement of those sodium and potassium ions in and out of the cell membrane, traveling at speeds of 120 miles an hour. And you can see how responsive they were in Sam's hand there. It was causing an immediate response when the electric signal was switched off and on. Um, allowing us to un make, make understandings about the world around us and also direct changes in the world around us. Okay, so now that we have demonstrated that, what else can we use the power of technology to do? Again, looking at this electricity. Has anyone got an idea for our next experiment? Taking this idea, this concept that our brain uses the power of electricity in order for us to think. Is there any way that we could maybe do a fun uh, experiment? Yeah? Can you use it to help people move their limbs? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's quite a lot of uh, um, 
developments now. I don't know whether you saw it was, um, in New Scientist last week. There was this incredible uh, video of this guy who had been paralysed from the neck down, and he was wearing an exoskeleton. Um, he wasn't walk walking, he w and he was able to stand up in this exoskeleton, and it was picking up that motor cortex electrical movement and sending the signal to the exoskeleton, which was then allowing him to move and walk around. It wasn't completely independent yet, but there's technologies that are really uh, picking up pace and helping people that have got problems with their spinal cord, so that the, basically the body isn't rece receiving the signals from the motor cortex. Um, no, so I, I had in mind a lovely little experiment that would allow us to read somebody's brainwaves live on stage. Uh, and for that, I would like another volunteer. And I promise I'm not going to electrically shock this volunteer. I promise. <laughs> You'll do it. Wonderful. Thank you very much. A uh, big round of applause. I'm going to bring this chair up. Um, what's your name? Julia. Julia. Julia, thank you. Hi, you let me sit down. Yes. Maybe sit down for this. Uh, and then I'm going to attach these electrodes to Julia's... Head. Tim, I don't suppose you might be able to help me with one of these electrodes. Thank you. Thank you. If I just put that there, that's nice and safe on you. So what I've got here is three electrodes. Um, quite often in science experiments, you, have, you can have hundreds of electrodes that are attached to like almost a shower kind of cap. Uh, and you place these really, really cleverly and discreetly in particular places. And then you can pick up the electric signal, yeah, please. The electric signal that's uh, occurring in these 86 billion nerve cells directly underneath the skull. Do you feel? Like I have the power. <laughs> you can make a dance and like. Squawk like a chicken. No, that's not going to happen. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch the electric shock off. Got to remember that. Um, sorry, bear with me. That goes off, and then EG. Okay, so what we have here is a slight problem. Sorry, you know technology. I think. That's <laughs> okay, hang on a second. So the suspension builds whilst I try and get this to work. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to do something which I always love doing. I'm going to switch it off. Then switch it on again. Hopefully that will work. <laughs> this is just a tactic that I use in order to build the suspense. Done wrong. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, edit. Copy. Huh. This should work until January. Okay, sorry. Try again. Quit. Uh, 
Okay. And it's working. I've got no idea what happened there. But, um, okay. Beautiful. So what we are seeing here are Julia's? Yeah. yeah. Julia's brain waves, the electrical oscillations. Uh, that's those sodium and potassium ions being pumped in and out of those 86 billion nerve cells across the 100 trillion of connections that make up the neural circuitry of her brain. What we've got here in the green in the middle is the raw electrical activity of those brain cells. And then scientists always love to uh, kind of filter things and categorize them. And so they've done that based on frequency, the speed of the electrical oscillations. And what we've got here at the top are the gamma waves. So if you imagine those brain waves almost like an orchestra in your mind. So the gamma waves are the really fast uh, kind of melodies, almost like a flute skipping over the song. Um, now, gamma waves help different areas within the whole brain connectome, different areas that are across the brain, to use these really fast electrical activities to send signals one, from one region of the brain to the other region of the brain. So it basically allows the whole brain to be connected. Uh, and if you've got large gamma waves, it's because you seem to be very good at filtering out background distractions or noise. So I would suggest that Julia is probably not able at the moment to filter out the fact that all oh, you guys are all here watching her brainwaves, and so her gamma is actually quite small. She's, just, she's struggling to filter that out. Now, in, oh, wow, something that happened there. Um, so Buddhist monks seem to have quite a high gamma, and that might be through the act of meditation, which seems to help them to increase their gamma waves. So if you now, Julia... Uh, close your eyes. So we're going to get a background resting activity of Julia's brain waves. And now if you wiggle your eyebrows furiously. So we're getting an almost instantaneous response there. <laughs> And that's picking up the electrical activity of the motor cortex, which is instructing the muscles to move, plus we're also courting, picking up the electrical activity of the muscles moving themselves. Now, what we've also got here is Julia's alpha waves in the blue here. Alpha is associated with nice, calm, and possibly also creative thinking. Uh, so I don't know what you were thinking just then, but there seems to be something that's definitely happening whilst <laughs> I'm talking about that. Down here, we've got the... Delta here and the theta waves, which are not showing a huge amount of activity, I have to say, which is good because uh, those brain waves are like the kind of the drum, the slow bass drum of the brain uh, oscillations. And that's more associated with being asleep. So I'm pleased that Julia isn't massively asleep at the moment. Uh, and then the beta waves here are associated with more kind of focused, high attention thinking. Um, which we're not getting a huge amount of either, Julia, I have to say. <laughs> but, but your brain waves are very beautiful. They are wonderful. Um, would anyone like to take this opportunity to ask Julia a question whilst she's having her brain waves read? Because this opportunity might not ever happen again. <laughs> Nothing too personal, she says. Or to, get, to do an experiment and ask Julia to think of something? Would you like to close your eyes? And imagine that you are in, wow, imagine that you are in your perfect holiday destination with oat cakes. <laughs> We're seeing an increase in the alpha there, a very big increase in the alpha, and then some reaction with the beta as well. And now suddenly you're in a room doing a maths exam. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, okay, that's beautiful brainwave activity. Thank you so much, Julia, for being part of that experiment. Thank you. I'll take these off. Thank you. So if you imagine that those nerve cells in your brain are sending those electric signals... Um, Scientists have been able to analyze those electric signals, and they're, starting to, um, they're proving to give quite a lot of information about, about a person's uh, kind of brain state, if you like, which you probably wouldn't find that surprising. 
Um, so quite recently, there was a study on vegetative state patients. Uh, so those that are unconscious, the vast majority of these patients won't really ever recover fully. Um, they will stay in a vegetative state for a high duration of time, and they might not ever recover. But there's a subset of those patients that do, and they actually completely recover and um, get all of their brain functions back again. And scientists have been able to analyze the electrical activity, and particularly the alpha wave activity, across the brain in these vegetative state patients. And what they're seeing is that you can use this alpha wave activity across the brains to try to predict which, which patients that are in a vegetative state are more likely to recover, and so which patients should have more um, kind of focus in terms of their therapy uh, directed at them. So this is a patient that's in a vegetative state that unfortunately will probably never recover, uh, and this is somebody who is a healthy volunteer, compared to somebody who's in a vegetative state who will go on to recover. Um, and this is looking again at their alpha wave activity across the brain. It looks like a wonderful Mohican uh, in this kind of visualization. There's also lots of, lots of studies that have been looking at EEG waves and trying to see if you can do some kind of qualitative EEG to predict whether certain patients have got a particular type of depression or whether they might have Alzheimer's rather than dementia um, or if they've got bipolar a disorder, for example, to help uh, use this technology as some kind of biological marker to help with diagnosis. Um, and the results are quite hit and miss with this, but there seems to be some promise that there might be a use for EEG in this way. But I think something that has astounded me even more than the power of measuring the electrical activity in the brain is actually a new technology that is uh, very new. It's been developed as part of an of a EU consortium of scientists working across Europe. Um, and I went to go and visit uh, the researchers that were working on this project at King's College London. Um, and they were developing this technology that allows you to use magnetic resonance imaging to image a brain of a baby that's ju just at 20 weeks gestation and it's in the womb. So it's just 20 weeks old, halfway through pregnancy and through the amniotic fluid, through the movement that the baby is making all the time, the scientists are able to develop a really quite high resolution map of how those nerve cells are connecting up to form that connectome of activity within your brain. So they can actually start to read how those neural circuits, how those axons uh, um, connecting up within that baby's brain. And they get uh, kind of beautiful maps like this. And what they're seeing is that they can start to analyze these maps. And there's little signatures within these maps, which can then, preliminary results are showing, which can then be used to predict with some accuracy, whether that baby is going to go on to develop autism, for example, or psychosis, or depression later on in life. And in some cases, the symptoms won't emerge for, say, two decades after this baby is born, and yet we're seeing these neural signatures in the brain, in the brain circuitry, before the baby is even born. Um, and perhaps this isn't that surprising because at the same time there's a genomics revolution that's underway that is allowing us to sequence the hundred, the billions of base pairs uh, within our DNA, our unique uh, blueprint for life. And we're seeing that there's particular genes and genetic vari variants that seem to predispose us to some very complex uh, and higher cognitive behaviors. So for example, uh, how much you weigh, even your intelligence, how long you might live, how resilient you might be throughout your life to mental ill health. These very complex, complex aspects of our behavior seem to have quite a high biological underpinning and we can see that in the way that our genes are read. Um, so some of the hereditary basis for these really complex um, factors are as high as 70, 80, 90 percent, for example. Um, and again, these are the genes that are involved not in encoding or in um, dictating how our toenails are going to be put together, um, but actually they're encoding how these neural circuits are going to connect up in the baby's brain in, um, during development. Um, now, I'm not saying by any stroke of the imagination that 
as when you were a baby, you emerged from the womb and that was it. Your entire fate, your destiny was kind of set in stone. Um, and this was your ability, your trajectory throughout life decided. Uh, there's obviously quite a lot of scope for change and alteration within a life. And there's been new technologies that are um, allowing us to really start to examine how memories can pass their way across generations. So this transgenerational memory, it's called. Now, there have been some studies that have looked at mice. Um, mice usually love uh, the sweet smell of cherries. And scientists wafted in the sweet smell of cherries uh, into the, where the mouse, mice were living. And they noticed that the mice were there kind of scurrying around, trying to find this sweet-smelling treat. Their nucleus accumbens was lighting up with pleasure, motivating them to keep on um, exercising and wandering around trying to find this sweet treat. So the scientists thought, this is very nice. Uh, what should we do to try and see if we can change this behavior, this very cute, nice behavior? And what they did uh, is... Uh, uh, not particularly pleasant, but um, they, what they did is they much like I did to Sam, they um, applied a very mild electric shock to these excited, happy mice. And the mice very quickly learned to freeze in anticipation of this mild electric shock coming. And so they very quickly learned through association that the sweet smell of cherries, um, instead of being giving the evolutionary ingrained behavior that actually they should start foraging for some beautiful treat that awaits them, they would do the opposite and freeze in fright in anticipation of this electric shock. Okay, so the scientists very quickly found this associative learning taking place in the mice. And then what they did was they allowed the mice to roam free and have a wonderful, happy life, and they didn't apply any more electric shocks, and they didn't uh, give any smells of sweet cherries uh, into their environment again. And the mice uh, had families, children, and those children went on to have families of their own. So now we're talking about the grandchildren of the original mice. And the grandchildren hadn't been exposed to the sweet smell of cherries or electric shocks. But the scientists were interested to see what would happen. If they wafted in this sweet smell of cherries now, what would happen? Would they prefer go back to their evolutionary ingrained behavior and get excited and look forward to this nice treat? Or would they freeze in shock? And what they found was that they were freezing in shock. So somehow, this information had been passed, this new pairing, this new association had been passed across two generations to the grandchildren. And the scientists tried to, tried to understand exactly how this had happened. And they looked in the sperm of the grandfather, and what they found was that there was a change in not the genetic code itself from this experience, but in the way, so not in the genes, the sequence, but in the way the, the DNA was configured. Now, your DNA, like a mice's DNA, is tightly wound into a double helix, and then it's even more wound and packaged in this really tight configuration together. And when particular genes need to be expressed, then basically that configuration will open up so that enzymes can get in, so that the gene can be expressed and proteins can be made in order to instruct how our brains and our bodies uh, are built and how they should operate. And what they were finding, finding within the sperm was that there was changes in the methylation, it's called, it's called the epigenetics, they were adding little tags that would instruct how those genes, how the packaging was configured, whether it was really tightly packaged, so enzymes would find it tricky to get access to it, or whether it was more loosely configured, and so it was quite easy for them to be expressed. And the changes that were, were taking place in the grandfather's sperm, in the DNA there, was instructing that it would very easily express particular genes that allowed the nerves from the olfactory bulb, which was how you detect smell, um, to then send electric signals, instead of going to the nucleus accumbens to motivate the brain region that's deep in the brain of the mouse and also in humans, to motivate uh, the mice to derive pleasure from this sweet smell of cherries. Instead, it was rerouting that circuit so that it would go to the amygdala, which is the brain region that's involved in fear and disgust and terror. Um, now, these types of mechanisms similarly seem to exist in humans as well. And there's been cases uh, throughout human history that have been observed where there seems to be a case for trans transgenerational memories being passed across gener generations. Um, 
if we look back in history, for example, of the famine after the Second World War, or if we look at Holocaust survivors, for example, um, and if we look at prisoner of wars during the American Civil War, there's cases where the, the children and the grandchildren seem to exhibit behaviors that that might not necessarily be expected to be passed down through communication, but there seems to be some biological underpinning to it. And scientists are interested to find out whether, again, this similar epigenetic mechanism might exist within humans as well, and there seems to be quite a lot of evidence to suggest that, that there is. Now, saying that, um, and there's also some a wonderful new study that was looking at um, little RNA molecules that exist in little worms here that allow worms to pass down memories across generations using these little molecules that go and stick in the, sp in the, in the worms, um, in the sperm. They basically stick to the DNA to prevent the DNA, the genes, from being expressed. So we've talked a little bit about how there's some bit of our behaviors which are encoded into the neural circuitry of our brain before we're built, almost like a foundation for our behavior in later life. We've also talked about mechanisms that allow us to pass down memories across generations using this epigenetic modification. But obviously, that's still not saying that you emerge into life and everything is there for you, you know, everything is already prescribed. Obviously, there is still scope for us to change our minds, if you like, and learn from our own unique experiences in the world. And this basically is the basis for consciousness, this ability of us to do this, to learn from our environment and to keep on building on memories and experiences. Um, and there's been some wonderful studies looking at exactly how this mechanism for learning and memory happens. And I was talking earlier about these billions of uh, nerve cells connecting up to form this connectome within your mind. And what happens is that as you learn something new, it seems that a new connection, a new little worm-like structure extends out from one nerve cell to connect up to the next nerve cell. And as you consolidate that learned thing into a memory, it then recruits more and more proteins into a receptor, so it forms more of a mushroom-shaped kind of connection, and it's called a mushroom-shaped spine, that forms a memory connection within your brain. Um, and what we're seeing here in this movie, it's 15 minutes uh, of time-lapse movie of high-resolution microscopy. What we're seeing is um, some of those proteins that are involved in forming that memory connection, the receptors in that, the tip of that mushroom-shaped spine, have been tagged with a fluorescent protein. Um, and we're seeing those balls of memory proteins being shuttled across the branches of the nerve cell in the mind. So what we're really seeing is almost memories being made in the mind, which is quite beautiful, I feel, that we can actually watch being memories being made. Um, so this is happening in your mind all the time, and it allows you to build on your experiences and change your perception of the world around you as a result. Um, but our brain has to take shortcuts in processing. It can't possibly process all of the information from the world around us all the time in order to make sense of it. Otherwise, it would blow a fuse, if you like. It, there'd be just too much going on for it to deal with. And so it uses those memories in order to make assumptions about the world around us uh, and to filter some of that information out. And so, for example, we're all used to seeing faces in our environment rather than the back end of a mask. And so when you see this hollow mask rotating, the shadows are telling you that the back end of the mask for the, um, from the eyes and the nose are facing backwards when you get to the hollow mask. But your brain is, is, is ignoring those shadow cues and instead seeing again a face pointing out. There's a more extreme version of this here. I don't know whether this is coming out. So you're ignoring the shadow cues and you're seeing a face coming out again because you're used to seeing faces uh, in your environment. So your brain is using those connections within your mind of being used to seeing faces and so it ignores this in new, new incoming information in order to see a face again. There's another example of how our brain makes assumptions based on our past experiences. So I'm going to ask you all to listen to this audio recording. So for most of you, that would be total gobbledygook, right? Doesn't really make a huge amount of sense. Maybe your brain can like try and make some sense of it, but pretty much it's gobbledygook. Now listen to this sentence. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. 
So the poor camel was being kept in the cage at the zoo, which isn't very nice for the camel at all. If we now go back to the original sentence of gobbledygook, suddenly, your brain is overlaying that sense from the sentence and overlaying it onto the gobbledygook. And forevermore, when you hear that gobbledygook sentence, if you ever do again, you will not be able to unhear the sentence about the camel being kept in the cage at the zoo. And if we start to think about the fact that we all have shared experiences from the world around us, so we're all used to seeing faces in our environment rather than the back end of a mask. And for you now, you're, you've all heard that sentence, that gobbledygook sentence, and your brain has made sense of it. But for people out there, they haven't. So there's some individual, more individualized experiences in the world. If you think about all of your experiences in the world so far, and your unique culmination of those experiences, you can start to have a think about how that translates to you having a very unique connectome within your mind, a very unique circuitry within your brain that instructs you how to process the information that's coming in from your out, outward senses in order to make a reality of your current world and also instructs you how to make choices and decisions in your life. So then you can start to get to grips with the thought that we each have quite a unique perception on the world. We each have a unique take on the world because of our biology, because of the genes, the epigenetics, because of our life experiences. We each see the world in a very different way. And, and perhaps, actually, that's something that should be encouraged uh, and appreciated. So is there anything that we can do to strip away some of those assumptions that we make about the world? Is there anything that we might like to do so that we can maybe start to see the world afresh again? Would you want that? Uh, is that something that you might be interested in? Well, some people are. Um, so there's quite a lot of coders who are working in Silicon Valley, for example, or even parents of new children. Apparently, they're doing this trick as well. They want to revert their brain to a more childlike, naive state, which strips away any prior assumptions so that the parents, for example, can start playing with their little children with more naivety and, and stripping away at the assumptions. And the coders in Silicon Valley can start to think more creatively uh, and, and use the full access of their brain connectome. Um, and the way that they do this is uh, there's been a growing trend for people to take um, small doses of LSD or psychedelics. Um, and scientists have been really interested in how this exactly works, how this seems to strip away uh, layers of assumptions that we build up in the world and how it seems to expand consciousness and dissolve any ego that we may have built up um, from our previous year's existence. So what they did is quite recently, uh, they managed to get some funding for this study through crowdfunding um, because the governments weren't interested in in funding this type of research themselves. Um, what they did is they took volunteers and they gave them a very small amount of um, LSD and then they put them in brain scanners to see how different areas of the brain would light up in response uh, to different tasks. And what they found is that here's people, somebody on, uh, this is a volunteer that's just been given placebo. This is a brain on a very small dose of LSD. And what you're seeing is that a whole brain lights up. When you start to, um, and the red signals high metabolic activity, so you should, which seems to infer that lots of electrical signals are being whooshed, sent around the brain. Um, and then when you transport this, this, these, this data into a different kind of data, which looks at the connectivity across the brain, what you're seeing is there's huge amounts of connectivity when somebody's on small amounts of LSD compared to the volunteer. Um, now, I'm not actually suggesting that we all go out and take huge amounts of LSD from this. <laughs> um, but what I am saying is that maybe there is something to be said for enhancing our creativity by trying to strip away at some of the assumptions that we make around our um, average day. There's other ways that scientists have been, and, and the general public, have been interested in trying to um, boost brain power. I don't know whether you've seen some of these films. 
Um, but there is some basis for this as well. So there's drugs called neotropics or cognitive enhancers or smart drugs, which a number of people have been getting, particularly students actually. It's a growing concern and problem at Cambridge University. There's students that have been buying smart drugs uh, off the internet in order to try and help them with their revision and their exams. Um, and these drugs seem to be, well, they're traditionally prescribed for people with Alzheimer's or um, ADHD, and they're used to help with focus and attention and also memory. So the students are taking these in the hope that it'll help them. Uh, and what we're finding actually when we look in the brain at what these drugs do is actually the opposite of LSD. It's narrowing down the connect connectome of activity. It seems to be narrowing the um, different circuits within the brain so that only some of those circuits are being used. Again, I'm not suggesting that we all go and buy smart drugs off the internet. So are there, are there natural ways that we can boost brain power? Um, yes, luckily there are. So staying physically active, running, for example, helps new nerve cells to be born in the hippocampus, which is a key brain region that's involved in learning and memory. And this type of neurogenesis, this birth of new brain cells, can happen throughout our life, not just when we're a baby. Getting a good night's sleep helps those uh, memories, those mushroom-shaped connections within the brain uh, kind of form so that the little worm-like learnt things do become a memory, a solid connection within the brain. Um, staying socially active helps new nerve cells to properly get consolidated within the circuit board of the mind. Keeping on learning, keeping on challenging your brain can help with the plasticity, help with the movement of the connection so that new connections can constantly be made within your brain. Checking your diet, so anything that's generally good for your heart is going to be good for your brain as well because your brain uses vast amounts of oxygen in order to keep it active so that it can use this power of electricity. And it needs the heart in order to pump all that oxygen to get to your brain and staying positive uh, so if you're a little bit glum or depressed obviously it's very difficult to do any of these um, above mentioned things so I like to keep a gratitude journal just to list down some of the things that I'm grateful for from the day before and then hopefully uh, that will remind me of things that I can do in the next day to um, kind of keep myself happy and content okay so the new technologies that are allowing us to peer into the brain and look at conscious moving mammals go about their business as they navigate the space of the world them, around them, form their perceptions, their sense of reality of the brain, and then go and make their decisions from the everyday decisions, such as what they choose to eat, to uh, the friends that they choose to have throughout their life, the relationships that they choose to have, and even how their beliefs are being made within their brain. All of that is starting to be mapped using this technological revolution that it's allowing us to peer into the brain with a higher resolution than ever before. Okay, so does that help us to answer the point to our existence? And as we find out more about our brain and behavior, and as it seems that more and more of our complex behaviors seem to be built into our brain uh, to, to quite a large degree, then does that make us think, well, you know, if we don't have so much agency, if we don't have so much power over our lives, if actually it's our brains that are instructing us to act in a particular way, then what's the point? You know, what is the point in existence? Well, I think neuroscience has got a lovely little answer to that, happily. Um, so there is this rudimentary organism which lives in the sea. It's called a humble sea squirt. And it kind of floats around in the ocean um, uh, quite happily, it seems. And then at some point, it will um, embed itself on a rock that it happens to have floated past. And once it's embedded there on its rock, it doesn't need to move um, because the ocean current will bring bits of food past that it can just gobble up. Uh, the sea squirt doesn't even need to have sex in order to reproduce because it's hermaphrodite, so it can please itself in order to reproduce. Um, so what this sea squirt will do is it will go, okay, well, I've made it in life. I can just sit here. I don't really have to do anything. Uh, so it starts to digest its own nervous system. It doesn't need it anymore. Now, we are the opposite of the humble sea squirt. We have embedded within our neural circuitry in this nucleus accumbens, this region of the brain that I talked about earlier that's involved in pleasure and motivation. We have embedded within our brains a desire, a deep 
uh, kind of rooted want to explore the world around us and keep socially active and learn from other people and share our unique perspectives of the world so that we can start to solve problems using different angles of creative thought. And embedded deep within our brain, there seems to be, to differing degrees for each one of us, this desire to not be this humble sea squirt, but to communicate with others and to share our knowledge. And there's been some wonderful experiments that have shown that um, if we do start to share our unique perception of the world with another person, then the simple act of doing that allows both of those people to get to a closer idea of what the accurate, real reality actually is. Um, but kind of the last thing that I really want to talk about here is, do we really have any free will? Or are we just these kind of, these, these robots almost, with this biologically um, inscribed and dictated connectome within our brain? Uh, is, there any, is there any pause for um, kind of free will? embedded within our biology. And it seems that there is. So all the way back in the 1980s, a guy called Benjamin Libé did some groundbreaking experiments where he hooked up uh, an EEG machine, as I did to Julia just here, um, and uh, he looked at um, the EEG, took traces of the EEG on the motor cortex to pick up the electric signal from the motor cortex um, to see when it was being activated. It, uh, he asked the volunteer to look at a clock to see when the volunteer was instructing uh, movement in the hand. And then it also used electrodes to pick up the movement within the hand. And what do you think came first? Was it the electrical activity within the brain instructing the hand to move? Was it the hand actually moving? Or was it the person saying, I'm going to decide to move now? Sorry? You'd say it was the person deciding. No, it wasn't. It was actually, there was a significant lag. What came first was the electrical activity within the brain. And then some milli, 350 milliseconds or so later came the person saying that I'm consciously deciding to move. And then, sometime after that, came the actual movement. So what's going on with that pause there? Well, this experiment has been repeated and refined, and it seems to show similar kinds of results. And some people are saying that it um, gives the idea that actually we don't have any free will, or we just kind of, we think we have free will, but that's just a little bit of pause in our, before our brain deciding and telling us what to do. But another interpretation of those results is that there's this pause button within our brain that allows us, those 350 mi 50 milliseconds, allows us to take stock of what we're doing, and maybe to stop, to inhibit it, or to add on an extra layer of complexity to what we want to do. So maybe what we all need to do is try and increase those gamma waves a little bit more and take more use of that pause button that was, is in, in existence within our brain. Um, and with that, I would like to leave you with a rather beautiful sound. This is the sound of a rat uh, that is being tickled. Um, so there's a professor at University College London who works on laughter and the points of laughter and fun. And she got some, um, she got some rats and she started uh, tickling them. And they love being tickled. They kind of they, they giggle with joy. And you can hear this giggling with joy if you transduce the noise of the giggles so that the human ear can hear it. And what she did was she... Um, started tickling the, the rats, and they would just start spontaneously laughing. But then after a few times, she didn't apply an electric shock, because scientists aren't just that evil all the time. What she did was she put the gloved hand in and went to tickle the rat, in much the same way as if you're playing with a toddler, you can pretend that you're about to tickle them, and they'll start squirming and giggling with joy. And the rat started doing exactly the same thing. It started squirming and giggling with joy in anticipation of that tickle. And this is the noise that I'm going to leave ringing in your ears, uh, being transduced so that human ear can hear it. It's quite cute, isn't it? <laughs> That's it. That was a quick tour through your nervous system. <laughs> Thank you.